from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. And not just any old log, this is our premiere episode of season number four. We've gone three full seasons. Our first episode aired, I forget the exact date, February 8th, I think. So three seasons under our belt. And here we go with number four. I'm excited. And uh, with that, of course, the new schedule, which uh, I've mentioned once or twice, if you don't know about this, I'm posting three episodes per week of the log. Now we're going to go Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. For those of you on the radio side, we'll offer an encore presentation on Thursdays in the same time slot. And then on Fridays, again in the same time slot, Charles Purcell Presents. And that's the uh, sketch and improv radio theater, audio collage, spoken word. That's the fun stuff. Some of it funny, some of it serious, a nice mix. And I'm so excited to be doing that again. We did that for a year or two. I forget the exact schedule. We haven't done it now. We haven't produced new episodes since the uh, outbreak of COVID. Uh, So we're coming back with that. We've got one uh, that's already posted, one of the new shows posted on Friday, and now every Friday going forward, we'll post new shows. So uh, so there you go. So congratulations to us for uh, beginning season number four today, and a reminder to you to make sure to check in on Fridays when we post Charles Purcell Presents, the radio art show. All right. All right, let's let's grab some uh, grab some headlines because man, there's been a lot of them since since last we spoke. I think the biggest for me, not that it surprised me, but I don't know. I guess I can still be surprised. The Republican Party on Friday, reading now from the uh, New York Times, the Republican Party on Friday officially declared the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol and events that led to it, quote, legitimate political discourse, end quote, and rebuked two lawmakers in the party who have been most outspoken in condemning the deadly riot and the role of Donald J. in spreading the election lies that fueled it. So the Republican National Committee, the Republican Party, the, I mean, this you can't get any, any more official than this. They've basically kicked out Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger the two representatives who both voted for impeachment and who are currently serving on the Jan 6 committee. They're going to be endorsing their primary challengers. They're basically kicked out of the party. And uh, yeah, they have now put their stamp of approval on the January 6th attack, calling it legitimate political discourse. Uh, I've been saying this for years, you guys. If you got an R next to your name, what are you doing? I mean, what are you doing? This is the party. It's not just the crazy ex-president. It's not just a few crazy members of the House and Senate. No, it's the party. I used to give people some slack. It's like, okay, you were born into a Republican family and you're, you're, you're good, decent people. You just have conservative values. And say, so, okay, you're not in line with the worst of the worst. I used to give you that slack. I'm not giving you that slack anymore. When 75% of your party believes that the election was stolen, when the great majority of your party believes that the insurrection was legitimate, when the official arm of the party itself, the Republican National Committee, makes a statement, puts it in writing, that we endorse this, when the great majority, and it's not just a few, of uh, Republicans in the House and the Senate have gone to the dark side, and at every level, State legislatures all around the country, you and I talk about them all the time. Republican state legislatures, they're the ones banning books. They're the ones suppressing the vote. This is the party now. For you to still identify, self-identify as a Republican, whether you hold an office or you're just a, a citizen, just a voter, if you consider yourself a a Republican, if you still put that R next to your name, if you walk into the voting booth and vote for anyone with an R next to their name, I got no more slack for you. What are you doing? You have to get out. This this is just, this is nuts. 
Now, Mike Pence, former vice president, got some headlines because he said in a speech to the Federalist Society that he had no right to overturn the election, that his boss was wrong about that. You know, that got the headlines, but he never said he wouldn't have liked to overturn the election. He just said he couldn't. His hands were tied. But he's with them on everything else. And he still lies about the opposition party, calling them communists and socialists and dangerous and all that. He's completely in line. You know, so, so don't take too much from just that one line. He's just basically admitting that, no, he didn't have the legal power to do it. But that's absolutely as far as he's going. He's going no further than that at all. So so don't get too excited about that. No, there there are not two Republican parties. They're not two wings. No, there are a couple of outliers. There's Cheney, Kinzinger. Every once in a while, uh, Romney will step out. But there again, kind of like Pence, it's only in individual instances. Like, okay, well... Like Rom- Romney is a perfect example. The insurrection was a bridge too far. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's about it. Talk about setting the bar pretty low. He's, <laughs> he's, right, he's a straight Republican right on down the line with every bad thing they've done for the last 40 years. So he's, true, he's a true blue, or I should say true red Republican, right on down the line on every issue, on every policy, on every strategy, on everything. He's 100%. But because he, oh my God, he's so bold, he steps out and says, well, I guess we can't try to overthrow the U.S. government. Wow. Way to, way to go out on a limb. And that's the best Republican you can find. <laughs> I put Liz Cheney in the same boat. I mean, God bless her. She's very forceful in her rhetoric, and I'm glad for it that the, the insurrection thing was completely unacceptable, and she's serving faithfully on this committee, and she wants to do the right thing. That's great. But look at every other single issue, every other single vote for years and years. She's right there. She's a Republican in every sense of the word, regardless of what the RNC wants to say. So the, the very idea that there are two wings of the Republican Party trying to battle it out no, that, that, that fight was over a long, long time ago. Because you can't count a handful of people. And there really, literally are just a handful. There's Kasich, the perennial candidate, Romney, Kinzinger, Cheney. Maybe you can add three or four or even five or six more. They're not a wing. For two reasons. One, they're too small to be a wing. <laughs> they're... They are in the minuscule minority. And even then, they are still adherents to all the bad things Republicans have been doing all along. They never spoke up about the first impeachment. They never spoke up about the gerrymandering, about voter suppression, about draconian laws being proposed and passed in state legislatures. So the supposed moderate wing rational wing of the Republican Party just really literally doesn't exist. There's one Republican Party. Don't let anybody tell you there's two. And and, and they're just becoming more extreme. I, we don't have time to go down the full list. Every single Republican state legislature in the country has just gone bananas with this ridiculous agenda. First of all, they lie. As I said earlier, they lie about the Democrats. And you know me, I'm no fan of the Democrats. I have plenty of criticism for the Democrats. But they're not radical socialist communists. (laughs) They're not trying to take away all of your rights. They're not wild-eyed radicals. And this is the picture that the Republicans paint. Not just one wing of the Republican Party, the entire Republican Party. The same Republican Party that stood there and watched Mitch McConnell defy the Constitution and deny Barack Obama of his Supreme Court nomination. (laughs) Thank God we got this retirement in the court and uh, a Democratic president looks like is actually going to be able to nominate a replacement. But it has to happen before the Republicans take charge again in 22, which they may well do. And if you've been listening to the conversation, 
Mitch McConnell and the, and the other Republican senators have come right out and said they don't even try to hide this stuff anymore. You know, the whole thing with Merrick Garland, it was an election year. That was their excuse. But then Amy Coney Barrett was <laughs> was rammed through literally while people were already voting in the 2020 election. So, OK, obviously, we, we all know about the hypocrisy there. But now they take it even a step further. Like I say, I, I think I can't be surprised, but then I am. They're, they're saying right out loud that no nominee will even get a hearing. If they're in charge, so not even, not just on a, in an election year, year one, year two, year three doesn't matter. <laughs> this is the Republican Party, you guys. As long as the Republicans control the Senate, there will never be another Supreme Court justice nominated by a Democratic president. They've come right out and said it. It's it's not code. <laughs> They're not being coy. They're not using cryptic language, reading the tea leaves. No, they're just coming right out and saying it. Just like they said their, their only objective in the Obama years was to obstruct everything he did, to make him a one-term president. They failed on that, but they, they pretty much succeeded on everything else because they did block everything he tried to do. The only thing he could do, were it, it, it took him six years to figure it out, but Obama finally started signing executive orders. Well, okay, I tried for six years to <laughs> cooperate and have this bipartisan dream that, you know, moderates always are touting. It took Barack Obama six damn years to figure out that wasn't going to work. And now people are calling on Joe Biden to do the same thing. Like, say, get on it. Just start signing executive orders. The president has a whole lot of damn power. In regard to health care, he can expand Medicare, he can forgive student loans, he can do a lot of things with just with just the stroke of his pen, and he's not doing it. Uh, just an update there. I'm just I'm so completely disappointed with Joe Biden. Let's not uh, give me a minute though. I want to finish up my thoughts on the Republicans. Um, yeah, extreme banning books, dictating how history will be taught. Just really awful, fascist, scary stuff. Every school board that leans right, leans Republican, every city council, they're all doing it. Like too many to list. They're literally having book burnings in Tennessee. This is not a wing of the Republican Party. This is the Republican Party. My God, I've been telling you this since the election of Ronald goddamn Reagan. Because that's the other thing about this two Republican Party myth, that at some point it changed or it split. You got to go back to 1980. That's 42 years ago, if my math is right. It's been a straight line. It's a straight line from Ronald Reagan to Newt Gingrich, to the Tea Party, to the deplorables, to the insurrection. It's a straight line. Because as I said earlier, all the so-called moderates in the Republican Party were fine. They were fine with the warmongering. They were fine with the WMD lies that got us into Iraq. They were fine with all the um, redistricting and gerrymandering that we see going on right now. They've been doing that since Reagan. They were fine with economic policies that siphoned money from literally everyone in the United States up to the top 1%. They've, they've been fine with all of it. So no, there are, there are not two Republican parties and there hasn't been. You have to go back to Nixon and then Eisenhower before him to see anything. Eisenhower, famous, of course, for the interstate highways. Uh, Nixon, for all of his faults, there were environmental policies. Things actually happened in his administration. But Reagan's big calling card was he wanted to shrink government down to the size that they could strangle it. How does that expression go? Shrink it down to the size you can drown it in a bathtub. Remember that line? Yeah. There are not two Republican parties, you guys. Oh, this is ridiculous. Here's another example. The, the Parents' Bill of Rights. This is just one example. Again, happening everywhere, this kind of stuff. This one happens to be in Iowa, where... The Republicans are advancing legislation that would create a parent's bill of rights 
to guarantee parents access to curriculum information related to teachers and other school workers and records relating to their student. This is a uh, reading from The Courier right now out of Des Moines. It would expand the program that uses taxpayer funding for private school tuition assistance. They're trying to do that here in Wisconsin, too. Just last week, the state legislature, again, I'm in a Republican legislated state, wanting to uh, bust up our Milwaukee public school system into smaller districts and funnel money to voucher systems for private schools. George H.W. Bush was famous for this. Bush the Elder. There were all sorts of education proposals coming out of his administration. He and, he and his buddies were big on this, attacking public schools. Yunkin out of Virginia, of course, won his race for governor largely on these trumped-up school issues. All the lies about so-called critical race theory. Whitewashing black history here in Black History Month denying the very existence of LGBTQ people, let alone allowing any teaching about it. If you're an LGBTQ student, tough. You don't exist. And the, the school issue especially, it's, it's really two things. It's money and it's bigotry. And if you want to define the Republican Party in two words, that's it. They, they want everything to be private. This was the revolution that Reagan began. And yes, before Reagan, there were the Birchers and there was the radical right, but they were a fringe. There's a, you're always going to have fringes. No, Ronald Reagan put it right in the White House. And the Reaganites he brought along into the House and Senate began the process. And ever since, it's just been the official platform of the Republican Party to just denounce everything public and promote everything private, including schools. Yeah, go back and do a little reading on the George H.W. Bush administration. That's when this voucher thing really hit the fan, so-called choice. But it's, it's really about just squeezing the life out of any public program, education, health, all of it, in order to create revenue streams, profit for themselves and their buddies. Because if, if you take the idea of any sort of public entity at all seriously— Let's stay with schools for a minute. And parents getting up and screaming that they have no say in their children's education. Well, <laughs> there's already this elaborate system. And it's very local, by the way. School boards are local. School policies, curriculum are, by and large, local decisions. There's already a mechanism in place. You don't need to invent any sort of parents' bill of rights. You don't have to scream that you're not being heard, you are being heard. You go to the school board meeting. Every parent can go. Every parent can go visit their kid's teacher. There's already a very open and welcoming policy in every school district I've been, ever been familiar with, and I have spent some time in schools. You can communicate with your kid's teachers. You can communicate with the school principal. You can knock on their door and have a meeting anytime you want. It's not a bad system, actually. You can vote locally for your school board, and they, and they make a lot of important decisions. Teachers, unlike police officers, have to actually get a degree. They have to go through four or six years of education to become teachers. There are safeguards in place. There are avenues of communication in place. There's democracy in place. You can vote school board members in and out. So why all of a sudden do you think parents have no rights? Well, because it's a small number of parents who have been radicalized into fearing and hating LGBTQ issues in the schools, any accurate teaching of the African-American experience. So there's the bigotry. And those are the two words that best define the Republican Party. Those are the two driving forces. White supremacy and money. And when the people who really have the money and want the money, when they form a coalition with white supremacists, well, that, now you got what we have today. So even though they're called public schools, you're just angry now because you're not getting your way. Well, there again, it, it ties in 
with the entire Republican ethos. Well, we had an election, free and fair, but we don't like the fact that we lost, so we're going to cry foul and attack the Capitol. We have a public school system that allows for parents and citizens at the local level now, allows for them to have a voice, but a few parents aren't getting exactly what they want. Wait a minute, you're threatening my white supremacy. So now I'm going to come to the school board and I'm going to scream bloody murder. And we're going to get enough people voted onto the school board to teach the kind of uh, so-called patriotic curriculum that would make the Chinese Communist Party jealous. Look, man, look how, look how controlling they are. Yep, bigotry and money. Bigotry and money. That's the Republican Party right now. And now add to that the third element of violent extremists. Now you have basically an armed wing of your party as well. So now it's a triad. It's the money guys, it's the white supremacists, and now the militia wing. That's quite a party. You want to you have an R next to your name? That's what you're aligning yourself with. Lord mercy, you guys. And you know what? I'm a freedom-loving guy. If you don't like what the public schools are doing, then just become part of the process. And I suppose in a way that's what they're doing. When you go holler at a school board meeting, I'm not going to be too quick to criticize that. Now, some of the violent rhetoric, I'll criticize that. I will definitely criticize the intimidation, the physical threats, the death threats. Yeah, when you when you start bringing in your militia to do some intimidating for you, yeah, now <laughs> I can't go with you there. But if through the democratic process you win, well, I'm not going to be happy about it. If I'm a more moderate or even left-leaning parent in your school district, I'm not going to be happy about it. But what are you going to do? That's democracy. Sometimes sometimes it doesn't work out very well. Then you just got to fight harder within the process that's been developed, which I don't have that much criticism for. The, the, the infrastructure of public schools itself, I'm not talking about the brick and mortar now, I'm talking about the, the political infrastructure. As I said, there's lots of avenues to become involved. So now in some places, the, the bad guys are winning. From my perspective, the bad guys. So what do you do? You just, you just dig in and fight. You try to get the votes. You try to make your argument. That's what democracy is. It's messy. I believe in it. But I don't believe in the tyranny of the minority. And this is the thread running through the entire Republican Party for the last 40 years and from the lowest school board right up to the Oval Office. It's one thing to fight on the battlefield of politics and democracy. It's quite another thing just to lie and to cheat and to steal. The Orange Menace tried to steal the presidential election. Mitch McConnell stole three seats on the Supreme Court. Gorsuch, Brett, I like Beer Kavanaugh, and Comey Bryant. And when Republican state legislatures are aiding and abetting local school boards in their state to trash accurate history, to negate whole classes of people because of their gender or sexual orientation, these are the same legislatures that are suppressing the vote. They're the same ones that are redistricting and gerrymandering. These are the same lawmakers who are giving every advantage to the 1% and every disadvantage to the rest of us. And by any means necessary, including violence and threats of violence. If you have an R next to your name, I don't know how you look at yourself in the mirror right now. I saw a chart recently regarding attitudes about immigration. Now, I'm, I'm not changing issues here. This is just an illustration. And I, just, I found it very interesting. The percentage of Americans who say the growing number of newcomers from other countries strengthens American society. Democrats, 78% agree. The same question posed to Republicans, only 28% agree with that statement. Now, here's, here's what I find interesting, and the, the reason I'm bringing this up. 
The same question asked of independents. 60% agree with Democrats that newcomers from other countries strengthen American society. And the reason I bring this up, I think it illustrates the agreement between independents and Democrats. 78%, 60%, a difference of 18. As opposed to the Republicans, 28%. That's a 32-point difference. 32-point difference between independents and Republicans. 18-point difference between Democrats and independents. Independents are twice as likely to side with Democrats. Look at any issue, and you're going to find similar numbers. Republicans are doing everything they can to institute, to make permanent a tyranny of the minority. They are a minority party, and they've, they've already achieved a level of obstruction unparalleled in American history. I mean, outside the Civil War, obviously. But I'm talking about any time we've had two major parties, we've never had one so successfully obstruct the other while in the minority. So no accomplishments at all regarding race and especially the violence within that issue. Republicans blocked it. Economic inequality, nothing. COVID, nothing. Climate crisis, Republicans blocked it. So the minority party is really just controlling things. Their obstruction is complete. They are the tyranny of the minority because they've been able to successfully block literally everything that the Democrats hoped to achieve with all of their good intentions. And I brought up this immigration chart because it illustrates the numbers. 28% of Republicans favor, name the issue. 78% of, of uh, Democrats favor, name the issue. A supermajority of independents agree with the Democrats. The party system is broken. Government is broken at every level. And the Republicans have found a way to rule as a minority party. Currently, all they can do is obstruct. But really, that's fine with them. Because even when they're in power, they don't want to actually do anything. They don't want to pass laws. They just want to decimate government. Again, goes back to the Reagan philosophy. Shrink it to the size where you can drown it in a bathtub. And they're winning. They're an illegitimate, fascist, white supremacist party. They have achieved, for all intents and purposes, they've achieved minority rule. Everything they fight for is driven by the money guys at the top, the 1%, and then the white supremacists among the other 99%. That's the coalition. And to that, they've added now an armed insurrectionist faction to that alliance. That's your Republican Party. And you can draw a straight line from 1980 to the present. Well, I'm way over my time. Let's uh, do this again tomorrow. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell.